<laughs> uh, cookie mm. crunch. Are you just doing that to spite me? This is all getting cut because Marshall's chewing. Ah, uh, Marshall, you suck. Why? <laughs> because he just told you why you suck. <laughs> You're chewing. Oh, well, yeah. I'm not supposed to do that, that's right. <laughs> Don't I do that on podcasts? Don't I eat? Yeah. We'll see when you start of course, talking. I can't quite see you, but... One eye. Yeah, one eye is enough. Hi, Stan. Hey, so, yeah. Anything new with you, Stan? Well, I mean, we released the episode on the uh, the podcast ending. Have you have you read the comments at all? There were a lot of comments, and there were a lot of loving comments. Uh huh. I haven't read any of them. I'm like, I'm avoiding jumping in there. I I waited until uh, the le end of the week. Uh huh. To see what the gestalt was, mm -hmm. and yeah, it was mostly loving. And a few people said, "Yeah, it's getting old." Yeah. No. <laughs> Some people get it. Yeah. Like Some I was about understood. to stop yeah, listening. I've heard too. you say that before. <laughs> so that's actually a supportive comment. Yeah. There were a couple of comments on the voicemails episode that just released where people were saying, like, I didn't get it when they announced the end, but now seeing how many times they said, We already talked about this in a previous episode, yeah, I kinda get it. Uh, well, the word's out now. Yeah. There's no uh, going back from it, but that's well, okay. Well, we could. It's, nah, nah, yeah. Well, we, 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 there's no going we'll back. We could be like, just kidding. We don't it's going to be it. just like life. It's going to happen. We're going to take it as it happens. That's true. And aren't yeah. you planning on doing like the occasional special episode anyway? There's no plan. There's no plan. There's no plan to do an occasional one, that's but there's right. also no plan to not do an occasional that's one. right. Charlie, isn't life interesting the way you, you just don't know? You can't say it's going to be one way, you can't say it's going to be another. Yeah, Charlie, what do you know? You can only know say some that things. something's going to happen. <laughs> I know stuff. The only safe prophecy is something's going to happen. How do you know that? It's I know it. Something's <laughs> going to happen. But what if things just stop happening? I don't want to debate this. This is this is becoming <laughs> no. a, 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 <laughs> So anyway, yeah. So anyway, the word is out that we are finishing, and that's that's old yeah. news. Any any new news? Well, the new news is that you know the comments yeah. that we're commenting on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, new news: Quinn is walking. Quinn is walking. So what are we at? About a year plus? She's yeah. She's thirteen months. She should have been walking by now. Well, she is walking by now. But that's an interesting thing. Yeah, but no, she walked throughout uh, through the full hallway this morning on her own uh, yeah <laughs> was, was, i mean there no, was, i was there holding was, her yeah there was <laughs> there was cheering and was there was there that feeling of i did it yeah she, yeah she was excited yeah and then what? cooper ran up to her and hugged her and she fell down uh. <laughs> yeah when they start uh, walking they start running really quickly thereafter as you know yeah Exciting time. Yeah, and then they start falling on their face. Yeah. Yeah, which is not exciting. It's all a part of life. Yeah. What else is new? Christian's back. Hello. Christian's back. I'm back. You know what I want to do in this episode? Tell Just me. because people don't want us to do it. Oh, I know what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> a Christian's crazy questions. Hey. Just because he's back. Well, it might work this time because- <laughs> It might work this time. It yeah, won't yeah. be over a phone. He's be, actually here. here oh, that's true. It was over the phone before. The awareness yeah, yeah. that the podcast is going to end anyway. I don't care. Means yeah, yeah. that if this is bad, good, no more of that. Or they can say, wait a second, I recant. I want more of Christian's crazy questions. And it leads to the next stage in your life. Oh, right. You start your own podcast yeah. called well, Christian's Crazy Questions. Well, I already have my own podcast. But it's not called Christian's Crazy Questions. Well, but they're, Christian's Crazy Questions are part of the Sketchy Van podcast. Are they? Yeah, they are. Here's mm -hmm. my commitment. Do you have a segment in there? No. Where you have like music playing, like Christian's crazy questions! No. And then you do it. Let's no, start it. it. it Let's start up. it today. Okay, cool. And you should post those clips. So you should cut those clips out of Christian's crazy questions and post yeah. them as like five minute little yeah, yeah. segments as promos for the podcast. It's not a bad idea. I should do it's that. not a bad idea. You yeah. should talk to me more often. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been gone for four months. So. Yeah. Christian, today I commit publicly that I will do a podcast with you and that we will include a Christian's crazy questions for Marshall. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll try and think of one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Man, we're off to a good start. This is a great feeling. Yeah, Marshall, what's your story? 
What's my story? Oh, <laughs> this is like a lead into what we're going to talk about today, isn't it? You see what I did? Oh, yeah. You're clever. Yeah. Okay. Um, but what's, uh, what's my new, story? What's well, it's with a, you? a story is a complex thing. I'm old. No, uh, no. the Not your actual story. Like, what's new with you? Oh, what's new with me? Well, the, the finishing up of the Draftsman podcast is a big deal in my life, Stan. Yeah. We just it, talked about yeah, it. Yeah. But we've already talked about it. So, it's old yeah, news. What else? It's an what old else? Story. What else is a, a what new else? story? Let's move on. We've got three more podcasts to do. Those to are record. important. Three more after this one. Really? Yeah. We're going on a museum trip. Yep. We got two more creativity episodes. I didn't know we had two more on creativity. Yeah. More responsibility than I expected. So that's what you guys got to look forward to. We got a museum trip. We're actually going to go to the Getty and yeah. just talk about stuff. And then we're doing creativity. Ending it with creativity. Okay. It all started with creativity. Okay. What do you want to talk about today? Story. Story. Storytelling. Here's what I'm thinking. This the could first, be a three hour. The first question that we should bring up is why study storytelling? Okay. Okay. Marshall, why, why should I study storytelling? Well, I don't know why you should study storytelling, but uh, you know, that's a question we can I ask you. I am the rest of the world. Okay. Let me tell you why <laughs> I wanted to study storytelling. Okay. Came... Don't even ask, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't exist. It's fine. Do your own thing. Just, just jump in. Yeah. I wanted to study storytelling because of a love of stories from childhood. These included television shows like Lost in Space. They included children's books. They mm -hmm. included movies, sometimes old movies seen on TV. And I loved them so much that I decided when I was a teenager or 18, I thought, I want to be a professional storyteller. So that was my reason for studying stories. How about you? What is your reason? Uh, the more I do things, the more I realize that like all, almost everything has some aspect of storytelling in it. Yeah. The way we interact with other people, we're always telling us some story about something or even if we're explaining or teaching something, we kind of have to include some kind of story element to it. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something as boring as growing a business, you have to tell a story about your business. If you're an artist, you have to tell a story about who you are, or this, you know, this brand of you. It's storytelling. There's a whole bunch of books on that too, like uh, on, on artist yeah, brands. Peter Goober's Tell to Win, which I, I never made it through it, but that was one of those things that if you're going to, uh, if you're going to succeed in business, that your, your product, your service is a story. Mm -hmm. uh, Storynomics, there's a number of them where th th it's, you're not selling a product so much as you're selling the opportunity to participate in a narrative. Yeah. Um, it just seems to me like if you're good at storytelling, you will be good at a lot of things in life in general, not just business, but just like social and all sorts of stuff. The theoretically, yeah. Theoretically, now, it just uh, seems yeah. like it is help it's a helpful skill to have. You know, I've got a lot of things to say. So, one of the <laughs> things I want to ask you are, were there stories in your childhood that really influenced you, that, that you remember back that they, they put you in another world, you went back to them over and over because you loved them as stories? As a kid. Yeah, kid or teenager. Well, as a kid, I'm looking back at movies. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> I don't what know what, some Heavyweights, <laughs> the movie comes to mind. I watch uh -huh. that a lot. Tell me about it. Give uh, me a brief good. synopsis of Heavyweights. Ha okay, Heavyweights, there's a group of overweight kids, teenagers mm -hmm. that get sent by their parents to a fat camp. Hmm. This camp has existed for a while and these kids go there every year, but the year that this character, our hero in the story, this year someone buys this camp and he's like a fitness guru uh -huh. and he totally changes the way things are done and he, no candy, they're only eating vegetables, they're running 15 miles a day, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> and everybody hates him and it's about them trying to like defeat him and he's evil he kills the blob he kills the blob yes really yes i'm not sure what that means and maybe i should wait until i see heavyweight yeah it's a good movie yeah it's good have you seen it when you're a grown-up i've seen portions of it it's still good it still me. holds up just because i've watched it so many times it's just hilarious to me well let me tell you when i was a kid there was a tv show called lost in space this was a uh, late 60s 
So I was, I don't know, I think seven, eight, nine when it came out. And we cared about that show so much that every week I was hanging on what was going to happen next week because they'd end on cliffhangers. Mm -hmm. And then they'd resolve the cliffhangers really stupidly. We were sometimes very disappointed in that, but then- Right, they, they resolve it in the first 30 seconds of the next- Yeah, <laughs> and, and like, Wait, they what? resolve it with some accident sometimes. The whole thing was this is a this is to make it so that all week you're going to be concerned about the Robinson family and how they're lost in space and what's going to happen to them. The monster is going to get them, and then the next week the monster has a heart attack just before he gets them, or something stupid like that. We were often disappointed, <laughs> but the disappointment only lasted for a moment because then the new issue would come up- the and we were involved. Yeah. Yeah. And I was emotionally connected to it. I cared about it. And then when I watched some of them about five years ago with some students, at any given moment, if we're alive, we are dying. But sometimes we're aware we are dying. And trying to watch Lost in Space episodes as a grown up, you become really aware that you're dying. It's an hour long episode and it's so bad, it does not hold up. Huh. So that is an example and many of the television shows of my youth that were such wonderful stories to us. So do they don't, they don't hold up because they're actually bad stories? Yeah. They're, they're, or they're, their production is bad? It, uh, both. 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 Okay. Yeah. But you know, some of the stories, there was one, but see, our babysitters, Bob and Wanda, wrote episodes of Lost in Space. We would watch them on TV and it would have their names on there. We'd cheer. I'd call up Bob afterwards. We talked a couple weeks ago about receiving compliments. I would tell Bob in my seven-year-old enthusiasm that that was the best Lost in Space that was ever done. That one of IDAC, Instant Destroyer and Killer, Crush, Kill, Destroy. <laughs> it's got to be seen. Warning! Warning! My foot, be still, you bubblehead! Rush. Kill. Destroy. Crush. Kill. Destroy. Uh, and Bob would say, thank you, Marshall. I, uh, you, you don't know how much that means to me. So this was a big deal socially as well mm -hmm. as, as just developing my consciousness for what I thought was a good story. Okay. And, uh, and he later told me, he said, we knew they were awful. We knew they were awful when we were doing it. We were entertaining children. And he also said, because they were in TV for over a decade, about 15 years, and uh, they, they got out of TV. They made their money and got out of it. I said, why did you get out of television? He said, it would be nice to be judged for your own incompetence for a change because you wrote the script but it changed all over the place according to what was needed by the network, what the network wanted. So anyway, uh, I'm getting ahead of the story though. Oh. Let me back up. Uh oh. Let me back You're up. You're being judged by your own incompetence. I'm being judged by my own incompetence, which is okay. Here's the thing. Uh, Bob and Wanda disliked television so much that when they made their fortune, they got out of it, got back into writing espionage novels which they, they loved to do, and they did better. Uh -huh. And uh, that was in 1970, and then they moved away from Southern California, so I didn't see them again. Yeah, what's the point of the story? Uh, I'm, I'm lost in the story. Mm -hmm. and I, yeah, I am this, lost in story. This is ironic. <laughs> You're bringing up a valuable thing. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> did I actually yeah. do something good? Yeah, irony. The storyteller <laughs> who starts a story and does not know where he's going and ends up oh, nice a terrible save. story. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> you just told me about uh, uh, heavyweights and that it held up. Right. Let me tell you, I brought in a book that when I was 11 or 12 years old, there was a book called My Father's Dragon, written by a mother and daughter team. Ruth Stiles Gannett and Ruth Chrisman Gannett, that when I read the first of this trilogy, My Father's Dr uh, Dragon, I was completely captured by it. It took me into another world. I read it a number of times. I checked it out at the library. And then when the library got rid of that book, I was not able to get it again. I didn't know how to get there, you know, no way I could get it in a bookstore. I did not read the story again until I was about 50 years old and I could not believe how well it held up. It uses a storytelling device of setups that will all be used throughout the story. Uh, it's perfect for kids, but it also holds up with a, with a grown-up's uh, point of view. And then there's another one. When I was 11 years old, Sunday afternoon, I turned on our little black and white TV 
and it happened to open on the first scene of a movie from 1939. Jesse James, Tyrone Power, Henry Fonda, and I got so captured in that that I was obsessed with Jesse James for about a year or so after that, enough to where it became a family issue that we've got a son who is in love with an outlaw. <laughs> but I got so connected to this guy's decision to become an outlaw that it worked on me. Sir, I just said howdy. Oh, howdy. What's your name? James, Jesse James. And then I didn't see it until I was in my late 30s, and that was another one that it held up absolutely as a story. Really, really engaging story. It still holds up. Okay. Whatever it is. So some so. things are good stories, and some things are bad stories. That's what I'm getting from you here. Yeah, that's, is that all you're getting? Yeah. yeah. So some things hold up. Yeah. Some things are good to kids, some <laughs> things are good to adults, and some things are good to both. Well, I was kind of hoping to just make it a, a point that, you know, some stories are good, some stories aren't so good. <laughs> yeah, I got that part. That's what I yeah. said. Okay. Yeah. First of all, okay, wh why did you ask me what stories I, I was into as a kid? Was that supposed to make a point? Yeah, yeah, it was. There were a couple things I was hoping out of that. Because I could bring up another one. Yeah, I do. That's what I'm hoping for. M maybe one that you you know about. Yeah. And let's see if it goes where you... Yeah. Okay. Home Alone. Oh, yeah. I, I watched that, I don't know how many times, a lot. I even reenacted it and filmed it and stuff and with my cousin. But yeah, I mean, you know the story. I, I know the story. It's do. a good, yeah, good story. Yeah, as a kid. It still, it still holds up. I it think does. As a, yeah. So, does that, does that, is that a better example for you where, with whatever you, plan you had there? It depends. <laughs> okay. It depends on whether you have any, any things that you can locate about it. About If you're going to be a storyteller, you say, this is someone who pulled off a story. Mm -hmm. What is it about it that grabbed me? And here, here's the reason I ask, is well, that when I was 11 years old, I had no idea anybody wrote that story. I wasn't thinking about filmmakers. All I know... You were 11 when Home Alone came out? No, no. When I watched <laughs> Jesse James. Okay. <laughs> it, the same. it grabbed me and put me in an altered state of consciousness for the better part of two hours that then affected my life of empathy uh -huh. with this criminal. It's historically bullshit. <laughs> but it was designed so that you would care about Jesse's yeah problems right okay well as a kid i identified with macaulay culkin's character what was his, what is his name um god it's been so long since i've seen kevin that. kevin McAllister. yeah kevin yeah yeah so i mean he's he's a kid and he, he causes trouble and so you feel for him and then he makes a mistake and then he has to solve a problem and you're like rooting for him. He's the underdog. He's got these bad guys, which are like monsters. Mm -hmm. And he defeats them. And there's a lot of funny stuff. <laughs> yeah. So it grabs your every. You're like waiting for the next funny thing. The elaborateness of the trap. Yeah. Oh yeah. The amount of energy that he puts into making it look like he's home that night with all of the dancers mm -hmm. and everything else. There's a lot of wish fulfillment for a kid. Yeah. As a kid, I was like, oh man, I wish. Yeah. I could do that. Like, yeah, he, yeah. He, he, he comes up with such cool traps. Right. I want to come up with some cool traps. <laughs> you take stories that, that have worked on you in your naivety and that you're not saying, well, the experts say that this is a good story, but right. this is a story that it is the story itself, mm -hmm. not necessarily the actors, not the production design, not the cool artwork. But the connection with the events that happen in there that really take me on a roller coaster ride of emotions. And then when you've got that and it holds up more than once or twice or thrice, then to go to it and say, why? It's like finding a masterpiece of artwork and being so moved by it that eventually you say, I want to find out what it is that that artist did that I can be doing if I'm going to be a storyteller. I mean, I, I'm guessing that the, the things they used here are their target was were families, right? The writers wanted to connect with families. So there's yes. something in there for every me member of the family, yes. right? You, you can identify with the main character. You're a little kid who gets in trouble with the parents and now you want to rebel, but then you feel bad and yeah. blah, blah, blah. You resolve an issue. You, there's the mom and she feels bad for 
disciplining and now she's worried about being a little bit too hard and so moms always maybe have this, this worry and they, they can identify with the mom and then there's the the brother in there who's just annoyed by his little little annoying brother yeah. so it's like you you have every member of the family that can identify with something and um good observation oh, was that? Oh. it means that in this movie everybody who's watching it is going to have a character that they can say that's like me that's what my experience is. I've got a little brother. I've got an older brother. I've got a sister who treats me that way. My mom mm -hmm. is this way. My kid is that way. That is a principle of, of storytelling is connecting, the, uh, characters connect with an audience. And with, uh, with Jesse James, it was actually his righteousness. You were the... <laughs> it, was, it was his moral outrage at what people were doing that he had to take it into his own hands, which okay. again, it's not history. But I didn't know that when I was 11. All I knew was that I saw events unfolding and I got very emotionally involved in it and connected to it. Okay, now, here's where I go from here. Mm -hmm. Having been in love, those are just a few. I loved comics. I loved all sorts of, of story uh, forms. And when I decided I want to be a storyteller, I set out to learn how to do it. I set out to learn craft. And okay. I, I already told that on our Epiphanies episode, is that it was 10 years of actively seeking, how do you craft a story? And there were no books on it, or if there were books on it, it was for playwrights, they were too hard to read, they, didn't, they weren't relevant to what I was doing. I asked Bob Duncan, how did you learn to craft a story for television? And he said, well, I certainly didn't learn anything in college. Let me tell you how we learned. And they had had an opportunity to write for television. They had been doing some documentary filmmaking. And they, he said that they rigged up open reel recorders to record the U.S. Steel Hour in the 1950s. What? It, was a, it was a TV show each week, oh, okay. like we'd have a, a drama each week. Mm -hmm. They would do it on an open reel recorder so it would run out of tape and they'd have to thread it back in there, but they'd get enough to where they could listen to the audio of it and then chart out what the story's doing, it, uh, doing and then analyze it and then figure let's write a story like this. They were learning it by taking apart what was already happening, understanding it, and then running with that. But, you know, I did that, but I was still in the dark. Finally, he said, uh, just get Dwight Swain's book, film script writing, and that, that'll teach you everything you need to know. And uh, I got Dwight Swain's book, film mm -hmm. script writing, after about seven or eight years of looking for it. You couldn't get it in bookstores. I read it, and that started to help but it still wasn't enough. Now, the next thing I, I got to say is why I'm teaching storytelling when I did not go into it as a profession. It's because in that decade, I was so frustrated that I then spent the next 30 years trying to figure out what it was that made it work and working with students, crafting. I was writing stories from the time I was in college all the way out of college, most of them failing and then starting to gradually, on my own, figure out why they were failing. And I've got two great big categories of why they were failing mm -hmm. and some suggestions for people who want to master storytelling, uh, what to do, how to invest your time in it. Okay. There were two areas that I knew nothing about. One was knowledge about the process. How do professionals go about crafting a story? I had no idea. So I just started trying to write a story and trying to get it right on the first time. And I had no knowledge of the second thing, which is what story elements are. What are mm. the components of story from a professional who does it for a living? And what are some of the principles about how to do it more effectively? And it took a long, long time to get that from anyone who knew what they were talking about. Uh, I took classes. And the classes taught me nothing about how to do it. They, were, they left us to our own. What did they teach? Uh, they tended to just say, do this, do this, do, write a story about this, write a story about this. Well, they just like give you an assignment without an assignment. giving you any tools. And then when you'd present the assignment in class, everything got applause. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It didn't make any difference how incompetently crafted it was. Right. So there was no it's learning story. of form. Right. Yeah. A person goes about painting, but they mm -hmm. don't know anything about color temperatures. They don't know anything about values. They, don't, they can't even define the word value. 
They don't know what form is. They don't understand how anatomy would be relevant to it. They don't know what atmospheric perspective is. And yet they're going to paint pictures and be a professional about it. It would help to take some time and it takes, it takes about a year, maybe two or three, to get one's head around what the elements of a story and the principles of a story are okay. for professionals. Now, and we can deal with those toward the end. So what are some common mistakes people make in the process? Let me tell you a common mistake I made in the process. Please do so, sir. Which is that I tried to get my stories into good condition in a first draft without mm -hmm. knowing what I was doing. And Ooh, is that a bad thing? Pardon? Is that a bad thing that you were trying to make it good? It, it, <laughs> it is when you begin micromanaging details okay. without getting a large story form. Okay. It is analogous to working on details in a painting when the composition is not yet working and you end up having to repaint over that. You wasted right. all that time. Which Big is small. That's but right. You were doing small detail after small detail after small detail in order. And then those small details are wasted right? because you end up saying, if I'm going to change this character, if that event isn't working, that means all of that dialogue that I wrote, all of that clever stuff that I had in there, that has to be set aside that's or so even funny thrown away. That this, that's exactly... So when I was young, I don't know, how old was I? Probably like 10. Mm -hmm. I tried to write a novel. Mm -hmm. I never finished it. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> God, I, I can't find it anymore. I wish I could. Uh -huh. But it was exactly that. I started with chapter one. <laughs> And I just like started writing and then I was done and I was like, oh man, what happens next? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I started writing chapter two and I never finished it because I didn't really know where to go from. I kind of like ran into a, a dead end, I think. That happens to so many would-be storytellers is first of all, you took on a novel. It's like taking on a screenplay. That's well, one of the biggest mistakes a person could do is why not start with a 20 minute story? Why not start with a 10 minute story? I was like why not 10, start with three? man. Yeah. I was trying to do the things that I was really enjoying at the time. I, was, I think I was reading like Goosebumps, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I want to write my own Goosebumps book, <laughs> right? Well, gosh, you are in luck now. Do you know why you're in luck now? Why? Because R.L. Stein <laughs> is here. <laughs> Well, <laughs> here in the studio with us. Behind this panel. It's you. <laughs> and he is You're going the to dude. give us a master class in how he writes Goosebump stories and he's going to give practical wisdom. Dude, people are going to get too excited. You're lying, right? Yeah, I'm lying. <laughs> God. No, I, no. Damn it, Marshall. R.L. Stein, for the cost of a master class or cost uh -huh. of a subscription, has a whole course. Even, even. <laughs> okay. Hey, even Wait, in. Really, what's his real name? That's his real name. No, it's not. R. L. Stein I'm is his real sure name. That's like a stage name. That but can't be his real I think name. That is his public persona, though. Robert Lawrence Stein. It is actually Stein. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, why would it not be? It just it feels like it's supposed to be an author that writes scary children's books. Well, yeah, it does, which is great that his his name is consonant with his his profession. But I have three students who have taken the R. L. Stein masterclass. And gone through that work and he talks about his process let me tell you one of the things that he teaches about his process is that okay. he comes up with his ending first that is something i sure wish i'd known when i was younger uh-huh i was wrong about R. R. L. stein it really it really is his it real name? Fake name he has two names or three names actually eric affaby and jovial bob stein so what's his birth name I don't know. Ariel Appleby. I mean, yeah, I thought Ariel Stein was a, a pseudonym. pseudonym that he took on. Don't you love him? Not isn't, really. Isn't he a lovable well, guy? I mean, I haven't, I haven't heard him speak. I just remember as a kid being like very angry at Goosebumps books because the covers always promised something so scary, oh. and then like the content never delivered. Is really? Right. Like there's one that's a diver that has a hammerhead shark that's swimming up to bite him. You read the book, there might be like one mention of a shark and the rest of it is about saving a mermaid from poachers. But okay, but that's... That's not his fault. That's the fault of the idiot well, marketers making false lost and yeah, promises. The cover probably came later, right? Yeah. After the story was written. But there, I mean, a lot of them did deliver on the cover. 
maybe that one didn't but I, I felt like the majority of the ones I read didn't like the abominable snowman of Pasadena it has this big oh, hulking yeah. guy, yeti and then the story is about snowballs that freeze people yeah I'm so sorry about that <laughs> yeah it's damn it Marshall <laughs> Why'd where you do were that? we uh, let me tell you another thing about uh, process that so many students rely on templates because mm. templates are popular. The hero's journey, the five act structure, the 22 steps to a great story, even Aristotle's three act structure. Stories have this, this, this. Templates have value like anatomical charts that show you the proportions have value, but they are not the way professionals tend to work. No, okay, hold on. Is it that you don't try to fit in the template, you might just accidentally do it? No. Because, you know, there's, I'm, I'm equating this to like composition where there's plenty of compositional templates. Yeah. And you could look at plenty of masterpieces and be like, oh yeah, that is a classic triangle, like, you know, for Zeta. Yeah. Boom, there's the, the template. It's like, well, he was probably trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's, I think it's a good composition. And he still did, he followed the template and it worked. It is. But so I don't what, think that it's a good idea to begin students who are learning pictorial composition mm -hmm. to say, memorize these templates or try to conform to these templates. Right. They, to study them has value. And to study the templates for storytelling has tremendous value because they are a logical sequence of the way the human mind works and what the what our emotions are hungry for in a story back to the future yeah i heard it follows a template oh yeah and they did that intentionally well i would it, it, or the, not the, this is what you ask them about robert zemeckis well, and people bob have, Gale. Right? or no Oh, yeah, yeah. They talked about the structure. They talked about how they wrote Back to the Future back in 1987 at a, uh, at a uh, symposium. But did they follow a template? They learned story form. They learned Is that the same thing as saying they learned a template but not saying it? No, no. I wouldn't use the term follow a template. Okay. And the reason why is because that puts the template in the position of a kind of power that can strangle the life out of it, much like putting me in charge of this conversation. <laughs> I think it is more of a process of gathering material and familiarity and potential events, and then as the process goes on, putting them in an order that will get the greatest effect. Does that move us in the direction of answering that? Yeah. Okay. But you, you think that's what they did? What they did <laughs> is, again, I keep saying that let them tell their story. I'm just going to say it. They, they learned, as the Pixar storytellers did when they were getting their act together, they learned from Robert McKee's seminar before it was a book. Who's Robert? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. They, they learned about the elements of story. Yeah. I guess, um, okay, l let me see if I understand. You don't follow a template because you might try to follow it linearly and that's not the point. You like, may you, be bound by that template in a way that the template does not, pardon? In a way that the template doesn't mean to be followed. Let's, let's, let's use the analogy of an anatomical proportional chart. Yes. I'm going to draw some superheroes in action. I'm going to draw some characters in a room that are having a family argument. I know where you're going with this, then. It's a yeah. bad analogy, I think. There, I've got the anatomical chart. That lets me know each one of these is this proportion. Is that not a fair analogy? It's not. Because not? It's, the chart is not a template for a finished product. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, so a storytelling template is not a template for a finished story? No, it is. It is it, what is it a template for? Here's what it is. Uh huh. Where did the anatomical charts come from in the first place? They came from real bodies. Yeah. That tend to be of a type. Right. And averaged out uh -huh. and saying this and this, this and this, these are the types. Mm -hmm. And with story templates, 
The mythical structure, as it's often called, the hero's journey, has 12 parts that are really common in classic stories and are still very effective. But to say, I've got to have this, this first, second, third, fourth, and to use that and try to fill it in has proven itself in many people's experience to be counterproductive. It's okay. It's paying so some too much attention to that chart. Some templates are really detailed and specific then. Or you can have a really broad template. Let's make the most broad template. The most broad template. Yeah, the arc. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. It is that a, a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> yeah. And that's okay to follow that? Well, when people first explained it to me, I, I, I remember, yeah, a beginning, middle, and an end. Whoa. I've got it. I've got it. And it went off and made just great stories. Oh, really? No, no. <laughs> when, when people- That start, was a good story. When people start to change the words, a hook, a spine, and a twist. But that's just as simple, but now just different now words. Now it's better it's more because we've got, we've got three metaphors. The first one is the first part of the story should hook people to where they say, I can't leave. The second part, which we, people call it a spine. I don't think it's the best metaphor. People call it a track. It's the main thrust of this story, of where this story is going. It's going toward a fight. It's going toward a romance. It's going toward a defeat. It's going toward a victory. Uh, that's the track. And then the final thing is that the last act, the end of the story, may in some cases, like a Twilight Zone or an O. Henry story, really have a twist. Or it may simply have an irony, but some kind of surprise for that last part. Twist you know, it ac accentuates it, exaggerates it. Those three parts are useful. That can get a person thinking, if this is going to happen at the end, then I know how to hide it, but set it up earlier. So, that's only three parts yeah. and that can be useful. Okay. Okay. So, to, okay. So, basically some templates can be good because they're broad enough to where you could, they, they don't restrict you to like a specific yes. thing. Okay. The, the cool. next one is the classic five-part structure that, that became so popular in the last uh, five years, but it's been around for a long time. It's that you, you have a setup, which is not considered a, a formal part of it. The story starts at the inciting incident. The inciting incident is the thing that happens that you cannot go back to normal from. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the story is the progressive complications, trying to go back to normal or trying to get something and it gets worse and worse and worse or more involved and more, more risk, more at stake. And then there comes a point of a crisis where we know, oh, it's this way or the other way. And then the climax, it turned out that way. And then the denouement or the resolution. That's five parts. Inciting incident, progressive complications, crisis, climax, which go together and then resolution. And that can be very useful because okay. it's big enough and general enough. Okay. What, what, so how, why why are you responding that way? Am I Because it out? seems like now you're, you're giving these templates, now you're saying this could be useful and it, should we well, use I'm going these somewhere or not? <laughs> the 12 parts of mythic structure yeah. is 12 parts. Okay. So, don't use that one. By the time you get to, well, uh, I wouldn't say don't <laughs> use it. I'm so confused. This is you, see, you're Do doing I use it or not you use are, it. <laughs> you are doing the thing that throws students off and threw me off for a few years, which is to conform to that template too early. Okay. So don't start with the template. I wouldn't start with the template. Mm. There are much better ways, much better ways to start. We'll get to them in a minute. Okay. There's, there's the 12 parts of the mythic structure and there's John Truby had 22 steps to a successful story that I learned that in the uh, mid to late 80s and it's got a lot of thought in it, but it can be really, really binding. So, templates are good, but I don't think that that's where we start. Okay, cool. I'm on the same page as you now. Where do we go now? There are many different processes. Uh -huh. Some writers get in the car and drive and say, we're going to go to New York. New York is generally that way. So, they move in that direction from Southern California and it's going to be an interesting ride. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be efficient, but it's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. And sometimes starting a story, not knowing where it's going to go, 
Well, it's going to go to New York. It's going to go to New York, but how are we going to get there? Right. Uh, it, it's, it kicks energy into the process because you write yourself into holes, you write yourself into real problems, and then you've got the energy of getting out of it. Mm -hmm. There are some people who work this way habitually, and some people can get away with it better than others do. Novelists can get away with it better because there's fewer people involved in the process and there's less at stake when you get lost and have to start all over again or abandon a lot of work that you put in there. So that's one extreme, which is to start with only a general idea of knowing where you're going or, not, or no, no idea at all. Okay. And then the other way is to say, if we're going to get from here to the other side of the continent, we're going to have checkpoints, we're going to do this, 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 we're going to plan it. And that will, for a professional in particular, be more efficient. But it will also lead you onto the major highways and you're going to be less likely mm. to explore territory that might have made it a more exciting trip. Yeah. You're not going to stumble on that little farm and meet that cool little family that yeah. teaches you how to... That's right. Go ahead. How to cow. Kill. <laughs> yes. George R. R. Martin calls that <laughs> architects versus gardeners. Because you can't predict a garden? Yeah, because you're laying seeds of things that could sprout and bear fruit down the line and you can utilize some of that stuff, but sometimes the stuff that bears fruit will take you off course. That's great. Yeah. The, there's the architect extreme where you've got so much at stake, it's the professional way to work. If you're working with teams, you pretty much have to work from an outline of the big events and then gradually get down to the final parts, which is right. dialogue and filming it or writing out the paragraphs. Each one has its advantages. Almost every process is a blend of those two. Right. And so, not to say that one process is necessarily inherently better than the other. Yeah, it depends on your situation. It depends on your situation. Big so team, small team. That's right. And to assess these takes some time. It assess for this story. You want to have part of your process where you do not know where you're going and you improvise and you put a timer on the improvisation and you really pour some energy into putting yourself at risk. But then you also take that raw material and start to look at how one part relates to another and get ideas with the big map in front of you. Now, that is the first thing I wanted to say about process. There's no one uh, process, but there is a spectrum and there are also good and bad processes. Okay. So, those are worth studying. Here's the second thing. And this is something that I learned after years, probably 30 or 40 semesters of teaching storytelling, is that when we want to study the, the thing that is most important at the beginning of a story, which is character empathy. It's that you've got someone in there, in that story, that you identify with, that you connect with. It was Kevin mm -hmm. for you when you were a kid. And it could be others in Home Alone for other people. That is a primary principle of storytelling that if you're going to open up on this imaginary world, I'm going to watch this story or listen to it or read it and feel like I'm in that world. And so in a storytelling class, one of the first things we do is we watch opening scenes and introductions to characters. I've got great collections of this. The opening 10 or 15 minutes of the movie, My Life as a Dog. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend the movie to you, but it is a masterpiece of character identification where you're watching this and you feel like you are this kid. Jesse James is that way. I use that to show, here, look, here's how we're going to get people empathizing with an outlaw. The first third of Paper Moon with the character Addie Prey an eight-year-old girl. These are masterpieces of character empathy, of making you care. And then when, in fact, we spent a whole season on immoral protagonists. How can you start out with a bank robber and the bank robber's crew, and they're going to go in and rob this bank, mm -hmm. and you're going to care about them. These are people you never want to know in life, and yet you're really empathizing with them. Now, that is a principle. Let me guess. Go ahead. They're actually good people. They're just making, they're just doing bad things. <laughs> well, we make a list. I had a list of about five things that I expanded to about eight things, eight qualities. Mm -hmm. And the way we learn this is we look at people who've done it well. Mm -hmm. They have gotten us to care about somebody we shouldn't and yet they've succeeded. Then we look at it and say, how? What did they do in the story 
in that opening part that made us root for this person. Right. All right. Now, here's the reason I'm telling you this. There can be an illusion created in a student's mind that that is the first thing they work on in their process, and it rarely is. It doesn't mean because at the beginning of the story, protagonist empathy is established, that a storyteller's first job is to establish empathy. In fact, those empathy scenes, those introduction scenes, might be and often are some of the last things the storyteller writes because they know where the story is going now. They know what's going to happen. They know how it's going to end. Mm -hmm. So when they write that introductory scene, they can set it up so the audience expects that or figures that's the last thing that would happen. And now the storyteller is working in a way that maximizes their strategic effect to get an emotion out of the audience. Does that make sense? Yeah. The illusion that because something happens first in the story that it should happen first in the process is an illusion that needs to be shattered early in training so that you don't go down that path and waste a lot of energy. Okay. Here are some ways to start. Uh huh. This is a great way to start. There's a storyteller named Donald Davis who would stand in front of audiences and tell stories about his childhood and have you so engaged and laughing so hard. He was just wonderful at it. And he did a workshop about 20 some years ago in Orange County. And I don't remember the title of it. It was something about storytelling from your life, your, from your own life. And he used a process that uh, Gerald Weinberg wrote a whole book on it called field stoning. It's that you, you go out into the field and you gather stones and you don't even know yet what you're going to build, mm -hmm. but you'll worry about that later. And he, Donald Davis, likened it to an architect gathering materials or a quilter uh, gathering yarn. And he categorized them into two big uh, arenas. One is settings. He'd ha have you sit and write out and you do this over a period of time. What are settings that you know from your childhood? What are settings that you know so well that you could give a person a tour of this setting? What are places that you remember and have emotional connections to? Huh? A lot about gathering material on settings. The next thing is characters. What people in your life do you know well enough to where you can argue with them in your imagination and you know what they're going to say in the argument? What people in your life have since died that you wish other people could know and that you want to tell people about? And you get a list of these things over a period of time, not just in one sit down. This is something that can go on for months. And then the next thing is to look over these lists that you make and identify where trouble happens. Where are the great crises? Where are the great conflicts? Now, that is a way of gathering material so that it is personal material. It's meaningful and he kept you on really basic elements, settings and characters, and then events that caused trouble. Those are the three great big major elements of story. I'm going to pause because like you're with thinking. the events part of it, you can go as crazy as you want. That, that's where you're not identifying events from your own life anymore. Because the first two, it's like people from your life. Yeah. Settings from your life. Yeah. And then the third one, you're just blue sky, anything goes, any kind of event. It can be either. It can be things that you remember. Okay. Things that have actually happened or not. How would you define story? Do you have any thoughts on that? Story is a series of events. Do those have to be more specific? You did really well. Uh, when we define story, we, we take some time in class to try to define story. And the most I can boil it down to. Uh, is a report of events to move an audience's emotions. Do you have to include the last part? Uh, yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> uh, because you, in some ways, need to add more to that. But that, trying to boil okay. it down the shortest. There has to be a purpose to a story. Yeah, yeah. The, you're yeah. putting these together so that a person will be emotionally involved and mm -hmm. emotionally satisfied. Right. And so you can elaborate on it. it can, a report can be a telling. It can be a showing. Mm -hmm. It can be a reenactment, the word account, I don't really like an account of events. So, you know, I, I chose the word report. But here's the thing, those events 
can be things that really happened, or they can be things that the storyteller has imagined. They can be based on things that really happened. They, they can end up being tall tales or fanciful. So the definition of story does not preclude that it, it really happened or that it's made up. That's just giving us a useful template now that if I am not making a report of these events so that it will give the audience an emotional experience, then why am I doing this? What is my strategy? Is that a template or is that a process? It's a definition. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's why I brought this up. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about field stoning. Yeah. Gathering material for stories and that it can be exaggerated, but it's coming from raw material of my life. Right. Now, here's a limitation of it, of, of gathering raw material from life. Your life. Is a limitation, right? That's right. Yeah. Is that it's very fit for stand-up comics. It's very fit for mm. autobiographical novel writers. Uh, it's very fit for a few genres that like this kind of thing. It's probably not that fit for superhero stories. Right. Any kind of sci-fi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, could, it could be useful because you're yeah. basing it on real things and stories, all stories are metaphors anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you had a particular loss, in your childhood, if you had a particular experience in your adolescence, you write a story that isn't literally about that, but it's right. very much about that on yeah. another level. Yeah, and you'd want a superhero story to be grounded on mm -hmm. like real life experiences if it's an origin story or something. Yeah. Like okay. Live classes with me starting in January. Storytelling, picture making, go to martialart.com. Do you know about Pixar's 22 maxims that Emma Coates, who worked there... I don't, know. Tell me about them, please. She gleaned from the story people 22 reminders... Wow. ...of what the Pixar story people care about. And these are elements? No, actually... Like principles to follow? These are or? principles, Pr yes. Yeah, okay. And they have since been... It's, uh, they are not official... She posted them on a blog and they kind of went viral. And here's my opinion about them. If you needed a short course in storytelling, those 22 reminders are really useful. Okay. Because they boil down what might take you a thousand pages of reading from other teachers, but they are not organized in any kind of logical sequence. They're, They're 20, just like 22 random tips 22 on random storytelling. reminders. So one of the things I have students do is go to those 22. Each one of them is worth a week of uh, fleshing out with examples and meditating on. Mm -hmm. But we can categorize them a couple different ways. One way to categorize them is which ones of these maxims do you as a storyteller most need? Because okay. some of them are advice for one personality type and some of them advice for another personality type. Mm. But here's another way that I arrange them. One group of them is about character. One group of them is about story. One group of them is about process. The ones about process mm. are by far the most of that list. Because the most important thing is that your process is getting in the way of your writing the story. Mm -hmm, okay. Then there's ones about character, really useful ones about character. Like character and development? Character development. And what is your character not good at? Mm. What are they weakest on? And how can you throw that at them somewhere later in the story to see how they respond? Audiences will care about that. Give your character opinions. Those kinds, of, those kinds of reminders. The ones about story are the least of that whole development. And one of them, <laughs> one of them okay. is number seven, which is to plan your end, get your end before you do the other part. It's the same thing yeah. R.L. Stein said. Yeah. Uh, so those 22 maxims are very useful as a short course in story principle, especially if you don't just go over them quickly, if you really do take the time to unpack them and see if you can find some form in them. Right. Okay. Actually practice them so they become part of your language. Yeah. They're not a template. Yeah. They're a consultant mm -hmm. who, if you are making mistakes in crafting your story, go to the wisdom of what this studio did because they succeeded above the other animation studios at the time because they said it was, with them it was all about story. 
that first one they did, Knick Knack, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, yes. It's just a yeah. real short story, but what a great piece of, of uh, turnaround for the audience. Um, um, is it obvious? Like, if I go through these 22 and I want to spend a week on each one, mm -hmm. is it really clear to me what I should do in that week? No, I think that they are a consultant that you can say, I need that. Yeah, but if I want to spend a week on one of them, yeah. what am I doing in that week? It depends on which one. Where I'm at is I feel like I really want to go in and actually read all of them and, and figure them out. The listeners probably want to do the same thing. You mean they're getting, they're getting anxious for, for this to go on? I, I, no, they probably want to go read that list. And, yes. Because it seems like a really good resource. But we're going to carry through with the episode. <laughs> yes, we're going to carry through with the episode. <laughs> so what's and next? Also, there are people online who have elaborated on all 22 of those maxims mm. and really fleshed them out. Okay. So they are, they are useful as discussion prompters. They are useful for anyone. And they are also not officially sanctioned by the powers at Pixar. They are... <laughs> okay. Emma Coates leaking out the kinds of things that had uh, the conversations that came up among the uh, Pixar story people. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Can I do Socratic irony with you on the next part about the elements of a story? Yeah. Good. I just started. Yeah. <laughs> what are the elements of a story, do you think? Well, you kind of told us already, I feel like, because you told us about the stones. Tell me what you remember. There's the characters, characters the, the with, settings. How can you have a story without character? Character, setting, and events. Yeah, yeah. Are those the three elements? Those are three great big categories of elements, yes. Okay, each one has, like, there's multiple elements of a character. It's like with a, with a picture. You can have a picture without color. You cannot have a picture without tone or, or shape. Well, you can't have a picture without color. Uh, because even value is, value is, is, is the colorless, color. right, right. But when you, when it's you have a It's not colorless. Picture, right. It, it, it is a color. It, yes. It's with, it is a color that we would call not a color. Okay, go ahead and challenge. Who, if, we, if, if, who if, is if, we? Artists? No, artists, we, we should say gray is a color. Okay, we'll say gray is a color, but we are not balancing warms and cools in that, in that black and white picture. No. Okay. Now, there's a place I'm trying to go with this, Stan. Just like if you painted with all red. Yeah. You're also not painting with warms and cools. Right. But you're painting with a color. Yes. It's not okay. colorless. <laughs> yeah, but I'm trying to make another point here. Yeah. Which is that character has a number of sub-elements mm -hmm. that may not be relevant. For example, when you are telling a joke character development, a character arc, character contradiction, <laughs> contradictions, empathy, character responsibility, all of those sub-elements or right. principles of character design do not apply to a 20-second story. Okay. And they might not apply to a three-minute story. By the time you get to more developed stories, you want to get beyond stereotypes. And so, here's, here's how you boil down the most basic elements. What do you have to have in a story? How can you tell a story that has no characters? Can you? It depends. Does a character have to be human? No, not at all. It can be a toaster. <sighs> it can, it can be clouds. Characters. Jesus. Uh, Should I end this? <laughs> I'm trying. Hold on. Hold on. I want to be a smart ass. I know you do. <laughs> Just let me try. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, Nope. I mean, obviously I know the answer is no, but I'm just, it's like wind is a character. It ends up being if it's going to have anything even like Even a setting becomes a character. Ah, <laughs> you are a good student now. <laughs> you cannot tell a story that does not have a setting, even though you might think, well, I sat through a whole play where it was just two floating heads and there was no, no reference to a setting at all. And yet, isn't that a setting? Yeah. It's like with the, what you did with the black and white thing. Isn't that a color? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. And most stories... I was wrecked. <laughs> most stories are not told with just two floating heads in a, in a black void, which is a right. setting. 
Right. Okay. And then the, what's the third thing? Well, I said all three. Yeah. It's events. Character, event, yeah, yeah. And, and settings. Yeah. Each one of those can be elaborated on. And here are some principles. If you've got a character, one of the first things for the audience's experience is that they connect somehow. They may connect by intense dislike. They may connect by identification that that character is like me. They may say that character is not like me. The superhero is not like me, but the superhero is an I ideal. It's, it's like me in my hopes and dreams. But some way, the character is the, as one teacher called it, the emotional door into the story. It's a way to get in there. That's character empathy. There are many other aspects of character. The characters are types that storytellers paint a character a certain way. The way Don Richardson said it is you're stacking the deck. You as the storyteller are in charge of who you see do what first. And one of my students told me about his dad who abandoned the family when he was about 12 years old. And as he unfolded that story, it was so heartbreaking, I hated his dad. And then as he could see that I've really painted my dad in a bad light, he said, my dad had some really good qualities. And he told me some of the good qualities that he could win anybody over. He was trying to balance out yeah. that his dad was the bad guy and his dad was the bad guy. But he was trying to balance out by telling the good qualities. Now think about this. Okay. If he had started the story telling me the good qualities of his dad, and then it comes to the crisis where the dad is going to abandon the family, I would have said, don't do it. I'm on your side. I like you. You're my friend. And there would have been the dread and the emotional letdown of a person I cared about disappointing me. You see, I would have been rooting for that guy. What's better? Because there's an emotional roller coaster ride with that too. When he so. tells me the good qualities after he's already introduced him for, for his bad qualities, it just makes me hate him more. Especially when he told me what the good quality was. So his dad's a smooth talker. He's a manipulative guy. Uh, I could have had a whole different experience if he had told it in a different order. You're thinking. I'm trying to figure out what you're saying. Which one of those is a stronger story? Which one do you think is? Well, I'm thinking it's the one that makes you feel like crap at the end because <laughs> it's a stronger emotional reaction. Yeah. Can the dad ever redeem himself? Yeah. What if he started the story with the dad being a great guy and then one fifth of the way in, he makes this terrible decision and then he spends the rest of the story trying to redeem himself and we finally say, okay, okay, you did wrong, but I want to give you a break. The strategy of the storyteller of what to do with a character includes these sub-elements. Empathy, responsibility, responsibility, if empathy is at the beginning, responsibility is at the end. Another one is surprises. That this character may be of a type but they aren't just of a type. If they're always of a type, that's a stereotype. Mm -hmm. Great for comedies. Okay. But there comes a point where it doesn't feel real if we don't see the other sides of them. And the if there's time. Pardon? The individuality. There has to be some individuality in a stereotype. Is that what you're saying? You can make a very individualized stereotype and still a stereotype. Right. Because a person- But it's more believable when there is that individuality in the stereotype, That's right. right. The dude yeah. in The Big Lebowski is kind of a stereotype, I guess you would say. He's a loser. He's a, he's a, a hippie, uh, an aging hippie. Uh, and he does not need to be that complex to be funny. In fact, jokes rely on stereotypes so that you can see that this person's always this way. Oh, they're always this way. Watch, they'll be that way if they're with their parents. Oh, they'll be that way if they're with uh, the stranger. Oh, they'll be that way this way. And it's always that way. And that can be entertaining, but it does not feel real because anyone we're around for a while, we start to see that they have a couple of technical designations. Counterpoints, they have little things about them that are different than the way they normally are. And then contradictions. 
They're really strong this way and they are really strong the opposite way and it's shocking to see. And the more contradictory a character is, the more it can feel like an assault to the audience that uh, it can it can make them be, feel offended by it. That I like that guy. I hated that he abandoned his family or the other way around. I hated that guy. I didn't want them to redeem him. Contradictions <laughs> are the richest kinds of, of development of character. So, the, okay. So, here's a question. So, like, there's an emotional reaction there, but it's like, it's hatred towards the writers of the story. That often happens. <laughs> and that's not necessarily making a stronger story just because there's an emotional reaction. That's right. And that's why there's one classic way for contradictions to be handled that is the hardest job for the craft of a storyteller. And it's to take the character from the beginning of the story until the end of the story and have them go from this extreme to the other extreme and legitimize it. So the audience saw it happen and felt every stage of it. And there are so many great examples of that in stories. But in, in movies, I start with 12 Angry Men because it's a wonderful example of character arcs. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Groundhog Day is a classic example of character. How can you have a guy go from this extreme to this extreme? And when you sit through the, the story, the whole story, one, one, frame at a time, one scene at a time shows you why that really could happen. And one of the most powerful is, is Michael Corleone's arc in Godfather 1. It's just so emotionally overwhelming to see that happen to a character. Now, what, what is that? That's character, giving empathy, then giving surprises, and then even seeing them contradict themselves to where the whole sweep of the story was a record of a person making a radical change. A lot of classic stories have that quality. That's character. Mm -hmm. Should we move on to setting? Yes. Setting is a character. That's the great principle. <laughs> setting evokes a mood. Setting has things we expect. Okay. Dungeons feel different from palaces. Outdoors on a bright day feels better than inside a dingy living room. And settings have surprises. Sometimes okay. the worst places are the places where the best things happen. Sometimes the big, beautiful homes and mansions with the people with all the money have tremendous suffering in them. So, a storyteller can craft settings to be recognizable or surprising or have arcs to them where the setting changes because the characters change it. They redeem the setting. They turn the desert into an oasis. They turn the oasis into a junkyard. Uh, settings are characters and that is the simplest way you can say, how do you learn setting? See the setting as an active and interactive character with your other characters. That's helpful. Okay. Third one. Events. Events. Yeah. Events are characters. <laughs> Events are settings. Events can be characters. <laughs> I guess they could be. If a deo, do you know what a deus ex machina is? Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, no. Hold on. Give it a try. No, no. I've heard of it, but no, it's like I'm gonna. A Deus Ex Machina yeah. is when the story ends. Look, I, my hands covered with the the sheddings of the setting that I'm. It's getting as old as you. Yeah, uh, a Deus Ex Machina. Yeah, is a final event of the story that solves the problems in the story and came outside of nowhere it just it did not come from one of the characters it's it's cheating the ending well wait isn't it something else though too didn't that come from something else that what same? are you thinking literally the god in the machine the god in the machine or the god in the woodwork that at the end of the story when you have this tremendous crisis you just have an earthquake that kills everybody at the end of the story you got a tremendous crisis and somebody else comes in that hasn't been in the story before and just solves it all. And it is no more fair to the audience's emotions than to sit through a prize fight and you're rooting for your character, your, your fighter, and then they say, you know, he's tired. Let's just bring in a fresh guy to finish off our opponent. It's like, that just doesn't feel fair. 
And He's deus tired. ex machinas can work very well in comedies, as has been pointed out by many teachers. Deus ex machina is every little Nemo in Slumberland is a deus ex machina. He just wakes up at the end. Alice in Wonderland is a deus ex machina. Uh, Big Lebowski is a deus ex machina. And it doesn't make any difference because it's so entertaining that the, the story is an excuse to put funny stuff in there. Now, okay. uh, events, that would be an example of an event that's a character. It's just an event comes out of nowhere that solves everything okay. at the end. Okay. But it's not useful to think of it that way all the time. Like setting no. as a character. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, okay. So tell me about events. events. Okay. Here is the, the principle of events. Events are things that happen. Things that people do. Trouble people cause. Unfortunate coincidences. That Pixar maxim of coincidences to get people out of trouble are cheating. That's deus ex machina. Sometimes events, uh, coincidences to get people out of trouble are funny because sometimes happy accidents happen. But events are the things that the template now becomes useful because we can see mm. that this is where a character who is comfortable <sighs> okay. has seen... a problem introduced to them. Yeah. Their life was a normal, ordinary world. Everything was in harmony. Woody's got all of the toys that are under his command. Uh, Marty's got problems, but it's, his life is okay. Uh, and then something happens that throws it all out of balance. That's the call to adventure or the inciting incident. One woman made a chart of all of these different terms of the templates and made one horizontal line that shows that the call to adventure can very much be the inciting incident and other people will have other terms for this. But now that template can be useful to say, I think I'm going to start the story not with an ordinary world. I'm going to start the story with a person in real trouble. James Bond, this guy's life is just full of danger. And then he resolves it. Okay, everything's back to normal in the first 10, 15 minutes. But then in resolving it, it has created another bigger problem. <laughs> this so is stupid. where events are arranged. If we're going to get past the 12-step template, events are arranged for the ups and downs of fortune. That's the most important thing about how they are arranged, that I feel hopeful. Oh, that I'm worried. Oh, I feel terrible. I'm dreading. No, wait, there's hope. Oh, no, there isn't. That roller coaster ride of up and down of reversals of fortune. I call them fortune graphs. People call them turning points, plot points, progressions, setbacks, reversals. There's all sorts of names for the same phenomenon. But one of the things we have students do is go to master stories and arrange them on a graph and see what the strategy of the storyteller was with the events. I've done it with Twilight Zones. I do it with, I've got about eight early Simpsons episodes that we do it with. And then when you started to see, there are strategies for how to get the effect at the end. If it's going to end up, you really dig in the worry. If it's going to end down, you really lift up the hope that if you want that vase, to crash at the end, you lift the vase up really high so that the crash is meaningful. If it's going to end on a victory, you pull that basketball down to the bottom of the deep end to get the maximum contrast of what happens at the end. Now the templates become useful because this is where the storyteller can arrange if they need to, if their instincts aren't just helping them along anyway, of where is it getting too easy for Kevin? It's really bad news that he's left behind. And then in a moment, it turns around, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. And then we have an hour of him enjoying himself at home? No. No. <laughs> just enough to establish it's the highest thing. And then to say, yeah, it's not as good as you think it is. And then we've got the ups and downs right. that take us through a strongly crafted story. That is one thing about events 
is the roller coaster ride of the audience's emotions for what's going well for the person mm -hmm. they care about and what's going badly. How come these templates are focused so much on the events? Like, is it, are events the most important part of it? Events are what tracks the story. Uh, it's the difference between a portrait and a story. If you show a picture of a person that's just a picture, we only know what they look like. That's a characterization. Mm -hmm. If we really want to know them, we're going to have to see them interact with other characters, make decisions, create trouble, avoid trouble. Mm -hmm. And those are going to have to, they have to, in order for the audience to understand them, not be going on inside them, they have to be externalized with, with events. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of the most fun that a storyteller has with, with events is setting them up and paying them off. Events that happen early in the story that later are going to turn the story around and create progressions and setbacks, reversals. My favorite example of it is Krusty Gets Busted. Have you ever seen it? Mm -hmm. The first third of that, everything that happens in there is going to be used later. In uh, Back to the Future was a masterpiece of it. Back to the Future is filled with stuff in the first third that gets brought back in to turn the whole story around from hopelessness to hope and, and, and vice versa. Those, when they are hidden, are called plants. Give me an example from Back to the Future. Back to the Future, the example is when he's going to kiss his girlfriend. And he gets interrupted by, save the clock tower, save again. He gives her a quarter and sends her away. And then she hands him the piece of paper. And then she writes her phone number, uh, Jennifer writes her, her phone number on it. And later when Doc says, the only thing that could do it, a, 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 a bolt of lightning, unfortunately, uh, you never know when it's going to strike. And then he's got the piece of paper and it says that it happens at exactly at this time. That is a setup, specifically a plant. We didn't know it was coming back to change the hope of the story. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. And this is a fun thing to do since they're so abundant. Go to your favorite stories and see what surprised you later that was set up, but you didn't suspect that it was coming back. That's a setup called a plant mm -hmm. to be paid off later. Sometimes storytellers point at that plant and they say, Remember this, they have music that cues you, bum, 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 and say, I better remember what that person just said. A threat, a promise, uh, the camera showing the brand on the horse's butt, and it lingers on it, say, better remember that brand. That is pointing to the setup. Could, could you have a pointer to a setup that is actually a distraction from the real plant? The best that I know of that happened in Toy Story 1. By the match that Sid put in Woody's holster. Do you know what I'm talking about? Later on, we'll have a cookout. That was a pointer. And it was a false pointer. I'm giving away too much though, aren't I? No. Because yeah. everybody already knows this? Yeah, every, everyone's seen Toy Story. Who's going to see it? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it. You haven't seen Toy Story? I've seen Toy Story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you liar. Uh, I got you. You did. You sure did. Are you almost done? Because I want to get to Christmas Crazy Crushes. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little plant in the beginning of this. We see did. that? Do you see that? Yeah. But it was actually Story a distraction because we're not going to do it. <laughs> okay, then let me hurry up. Hurry up. Shall I hurry up? <laughs> I wouldn't. I don't want to hurry. People are going to hate Christian's crazy questions even yeah, more. Even <laughs> like, what? You rushed through it just well, we've to get gone to that? On for two hours, right? Yeah, we've, this is long. Yeah. Which is, know. you know, Marshall, it's fine. People don't mind, won't mind a longer episode knowing that this is one of yeah. the last episodes. Yeah. And this deserves Yeah, it. yes. Toy Story has the best hidden plant that I know of in a movie that was distracted by a pointer. Okay. Spoil alert. Spoil <laughs> Spoiler alert. If you have not seen Toy Story, do not allow me to ruin it for you. Just speed up to the next 
part that tells you where we're going from, from this because I'm going to give away the yeah. biggest one. There'll, there'll be a marker. Yeah. At the end, when they're trying to get back to Andes, we have, in that period of time, we have a huge number of reversals where they're going to make it, they're not going to make it, they're going to make it, they're not going to make it. It's just an incredible masterpiece of ups and downs that are the most extremes. And one of them was that Buzz had a rocket on his back and Woody like a, has a like match a in his hole. Like a rocket, it, it was tied to him by, by Sid. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. Now, here's what happens. When Buzz is introduced in the story, he's got a glass helmet. It's really established. We don't know that's coming back. When Sid tortures Woody, he tortures him with a magnifying glass and the sun's rays. We don't know that's coming back. Both of those things were interesting in and of their own right. Mm -hmm. But Sid also put a match into Woody's holster when it's going to rain. He says later on, we'll have a cookout. And that's a pointer. Oh, he's going to light him on fire or do something like that. So that's a bad thing. But then when they are trying to get back to Andy's, to the new house, they're stranded. There's, there's no hope. They don't, don't know how to get there. And then Woody realizes, I've got this match. And we say, oh, and you know what happens next, right? He lights the match. Good news. Truck goes by, yanked away. Now there is absolutely no hope. And then Woody sees that the sun going through Buzz's glass helmet can do the same thing Sid did to him and they light it. That's good news. And then the bad news is he's got a rocket on his back and they're going to blow up. But the good news is that he can take it off really quickly and they get up there and then the, you know, you're flying. No, I'm falling with style. It was just an up, down, up, <laughs> down, up, down. Okay. And those things were established earlier. It was, to me, it was a brilliant piece of story strategy to unite the first part of the story and the last part of the story. And one of the things that when you do plants, pointers, subplots too, all that's a whole other thing, and make it so that later they come back and affect the story, it means that everyone who sat through the story from the beginning is in the club. They know the context of this and they understand, okay, that's, that's a satisfying feeling that that thing I'm in on is so significant at the end. You're looking pensive. No, I'm satisfied. That's good. That's a good kind of pensive. Is this giving you ideas for stories? Yeah. I just, like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I liked your story. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm, you took me back to, to Toy Story and I was like, mm. Good ending. Cooper watched it recently and I was... I got to tell you about the experience of story, Toy Story with a four and a half year old. It came right. out when my son was four and a half years old. We went to see it at the theater. Mm -hmm. He was sitting to the left of me. We did not have television. He was not that sophisticated about how stories work at four and a half years old. We're in a public movie theater. He's watching this. And there's a part where they're stranded at the gas station and a truck comes up while Woody is on the ground and it stops just before it's going to run over his head and his head goes like this. And I hear to my left, I hear this. Ah! I say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He says, how do you know? And then sure enough, they got through that. But then the fight with Buzz and the back and forth. And for the rest of that movie, it was a roller coaster ride of the awareness that a four and a half year old sitting right next to me is about to have a public meltdown. And I kept saying, I kept saying, it's going to be okay. This will be okay. And he kept saying, how do you know? And it occurred to me, he did not know <laughs> this is a that this was written. <laughs> a four and a half year old brain does not know that people contrived this. Yeah. But never was I so aware 
of fortune dynamics. Never was I so aware that when anything goes well, it is going to be pulled away to go badly and up and down and up and down to the end. Afterward, I said, what do you think of the movie? He said, I hated it. <laughs> but by the time he was seven and he watched it, he loved it. It's just that yeah. that the intensity of those ups and downs were so great. That dug into me the value of involving an audience by never letting them to have it go too well for too long or go too badly for too long without giving them relief. This, mm. is, this is weaving a story for the emotional roller coaster and also for events tying together. I'm going to give a set of suggestions for how to learn storytelling. Okay. The first thing is, Pixar's uh, maxim number 10, I think it is, uh, study great stories and take the time to discuss them with people, to chart out their fortune graphs, to make character maps if that hel helps. I would recommend at least three Simpsons episodes. Let me tell you what Simpsons episodes I highly recommend. If you're going to study story with me, I watch these ones because these are ones that I'm going to take time with. The first is Bart the Daredevil. Bart the Daredevil is a masterpiece of reversals, among other things. It exemplifies character desire, conflicts, and reversals. Cool. A second one is Krusty Gets Busted because Krusty Gets Busted exemplifies setups, plants, and payoffs. A third one is Bart gets an F. Bart gets an F, has hardly any plants and payoffs. I think two of them, two or three of them, one of them just immediate. Bart gets an F, has great pointers that make you figure, how's he going to do that? Oh, something's coming, is an example of protagonist responsibility. It is not a deus ex machina. And then there are a whole bunch of other things that we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about the, the interest strategies, the difference between mystery and suspense and dramatic irony, which every storyteller who tells a story is telling a story in one of those modes, whether they know it or not. And I use the telltale head for that because the writers of that episode who wrote it really rapidly, they wrote the episode and then they made a major change to what we were talking about with my student whose dad abandoned the family. They decided to put one part toward the end at the beginning and it made it a stronger story to let everybody know where this is going. But Telltale Head is another one that I would add into there and a few others. I recommend those as stories that are only 25 minutes or 23 minutes for students to analyze. Can't cool. do much better. Okay. And if you say, but I don't want to do Simpsons episodes, Groundhog Day, Paper Moon, Godfather, whatever genre that you're going to do. So the next thing on, on the list, try your own practice. Yes, give it a shot. Otherwise, all we do is become theorists. We can talk about story on podcasts or yeah. with, with relatives and they can say, oh gosh, you know so much. But it is only theoretical knowledge until we do the really, really hard work, which is to try to see a story through. And mm -hmm. I recommend to start we, we, the way we did it uh, in the last uh, few years in the Fundamentals of Storytelling class is uh, a one-minute story by midterm and a three-minute story for the final. And you can put you can put 100 hours into a three-minute story or you can put two or three hours into a three-minute story, depending on how important it is to you. But start small. Comics are just great. To do a four-page with Tad, we used to do four-page Nemo stories. That can be 10 panels. It can be 40 panels, depending on how many you've got uh, on the page, but shorter is better to start. And then if you're talking about this story with other people and comparing it to your great masters who you're so impressed with, then you've got a standard by which you can compare whether you've handled these reversals well, whether you've really made a, an ending that is worthwhile. We spend at least a week, but you could spend a season on killer endings. What makes a story that might not be that good in a lot of ways, a great ending. Casablanca is a great ending. Watched uh, Gran Torino recently, it's Flight with Denzel Washington. There are some stories that it does not make any difference whether they were great in every way. The ending is so powerful that it's worthy. And mm -hmm. to say, what is it? 
and we make lists of what is it that has to happen previous to that that makes that ending so emotionally powerful and meaningful and then say, how do I apply this to my story and brainstorm mm -hmm. those ideas? That's a good point. Yeah. What's the next thing? Get to know your genre. Yes. The value of getting to know your genre is that if you're going to write 23 minute sitcoms or animated sitcoms, mm -hmm. then not everything in there applies to the personal story that's supposed to be based on what really happened in your life. Not everything that a stand up comic is going to use in their genre of storytelling is going to apply to a, a TV series that's a drama of somebody's life unraveling. Mm. And so the more a person, beca a storyteller becomes familiar with their genre, and Alan Moore makes a big deal out of this, the more you know your genre, the more you can see that's been done, that's been done, that's been done. And then when you tap into, I know how to do, I know what they do. What has not been done? How could I mess around with this? Maybe evolve the genre, but at least to experiment around with the genre. But you're experimenting around on a playing field that you know from experience. So that's the value is that you can't study a hundred stories. It'll take too long, but you can study a dozen or 20 and then say, I'm going to specialize in my favorite stories that are of this genre and get to know them pretty well. Okay. What else? Critique your work. Critique your work and get to know cardinal sins of storytellers. The first cardinal sin we'll say is to be boring, to tell a story where the audience tunes out. Pixar has a maxim, don't just indulge what you like to write. Make sure you're thinking about the audience. Character empathy and reversals have everything to do with that. Interesting is where you don't know what's coming next, but you're worried or you're hopeful and the roller coaster ride is happening. Ro roller coaster rides are not boring. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one is meandering versus wo woven. Are these just random events going all over the place and the audience is seeking a way? For them to come together, which is what's going on in your head as I talk. Is th how does this relate to anything? Where is previous? this guy going with this? Yeah. And that's where horizontal lines can help because you can say this weaves up to this, this one, it, and it's hidden. They don't know it's coming back when this one is not hidden. It's out in the open. They're expecting that to come back. Uh, that is weaving things together rather than meandering. And a third one is how killer endings happen. Disappointing. Eh, it was pretty good. Didn't like the end that much. Why didn't you like the ending? Well, I don't like it when people die. Well, that's your issue. <laughs> but when... That's your problem. When, when people die and it's really emotionally powerful, we'll call that a satisfying ending. And a disappointing ending is one where the ending was not justified or set up properly or there was no sacrifice, that's a major one. If there was no sacrifice on somebody's behalf to bring about that ending, that is a major risk for a story. It can be done. But most real powerful endings, you have got somebody making a choice because of that third of those five basic hmm. portions of the template the sacrifice. Yeah. Does it have, so it has to be a character or a character has to give up something? There's a movie called Sophie's Choice that is one of the most powerful examples of a sacrifice. It's, it's just one little scene of the movie, but it's what the movie is titled after. That typically in a classically structured story, mm -hmm. the ending happens because a character either chose to get their act together to make the lightning strike that DeLorean, mm -hmm. the, the character either chose to be on time or not, to give up this so that they could get that. The character makes a choice where there is some pain or loss in the choice because this is fundamental to human life anyway. So if the story is going to relate to human life and be satisfying, we get a chance to vicariously experience someone else going this way or that way and see what the result of it is mm -hmm. at the end. It may be horrible, it may be wonderful, 
It may be that they got what they wanted, but they had to lose something that they wanted, but it's okay. It may be that they got what they wanted and it's the worst thing that ever could have happened to them because look what they got with it. There's all sorts of ways it can go, but sacrifice is a very common aspect of satisfying stories. Okay. Cool. Well. Cool story, bro. I've never <laughs> talked so long on a podcast and that's saying something. <laughs> I thought it was good, though. Yeah, I learned a lot. Good. Now you're going to apply it. Are you working on a story? No? I mean, well, I mean, always, right? Everyone is. Yeah, I want. I want to. Anyway, guess what time it is? Do I have to like do some kind of setup and all this? Like, you have to sing a song. That's a whole other thing. That's timing. Okay. Go ahead. Let's try it. Let's time it dramatically. Go ahead. Are you ready? What's next, Stan? Christian's crazy question. I was thinking we could delay it a little further by me saying, does it start with a K? Yes, it does. Oh, then I think I know what it is. Oh my God. You know, I love that Christian's crazy question sounds like it's the same letter, but it's actually three different letters. It sure <laughs> is. I didn't know that. KCQ. Well, okay. So I wrote down a few questions. Normally they have context. And I think in the past they haven't worked because there, there was a lack of context. I wasn't there. Like one of the okay. questions I thought, it's like, what would it take to shave your head right now? What would it take? Yeah, yeah. A razor blade. I, I'm, I'm trying to formulate the question right now, actually. I'm, I'm just telling you. Which that wasn't the question. Are. That wasn't the question. Jesus Christ. Uh, well, I, I'll tell you which questions I wrote down. Uh, Stan, would you fight me right now? No. Okay. <laughs> That's not the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do it right now. That's yeah. stupid, okay. dude. You child. Uh, uh, so I wrote down three so three things. I couldn't think of the like you get this, but I thought of the butt part of it. So of course you would think okay. of a butt. <laughs> um, so your your nose is always runny. I don't know what you get from having this allergies. And, well, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I think we should have a hard restart if we're gonna actually. Yeah, let's do a hard one. restart. Let's do a hard restart. I just feel like if you're saying I don't have this part figured out, uh, the audience is already against you. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those three. Do a hard restart. Okay, hard restart. Christian, ask us a crazy question. <laughs> it's so much pressure. All I know that doesn't help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, your nose is always runny, or your hands are always sticky. This is it? Yeah. Then pick another one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wrong choice. Yeah, see? I don't know. It's well, okay. Do you remember when we were sitting in the office and we were talking about how uh, you get a cup of, you, you have a cup of coffee, but it never runs out or do you take a billion dollars? Oh, I remember that vividly. Yeah. And we talked for like three hours about- <laughs> No, we didn't. Like, an hour. An hour. Okay. We, it was like the whole lunch yeah, break. We, we, well, and plus a little bit. Yeah, plus we, a little yeah, bit. Like 30 minutes. So okay. Like two hours. And we talked- that is not, the math was not equal to that. Okay. An hour plus 30 minutes, Anything so two you say hours. is going to be wrong. <laughs> okay. I, I, more, an unreasonable amount of time talking about it. We, we spent, uh, yeah. uh, we identified that you could create an entire coffee company out of this. Yes. And we, we looked up how the rate at which. So you're coffee. reminiscing one of your good questions. <laughs> no, no. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't think it was a good question, honestly. Should we do a hard restart? Your hands are always sticky, or you always have wet socks. That was the initial question. Yeah, I'm questioning Crazy Christian. <laughs> yeah, again, I, I'm, I'm asking. You know, I, uh, we gave it a shot. <laughs> Try my best. How many crazy questions did you ask on your crazy adventure? It was more, uh, I guess it's never about the question specifically. Like, I asked somebody. It is this time. I'm asking you a f question. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> Stop being so would, evasive, Chris. Okay, well. You asked a lot of crazy questions on your trip. I guess so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ask us the one that led to the best conversation. Um, see, I can't think of it off the top of my head. What? Well, let's give Christian another chance. Let's do a hard restart. But the way I approach these things is that it takes like, it takes like an hour to get into the conversation. We haven't got that. Be we haven't got that. I, I think, <laughs> Is that I think what you I, said? I would have yeah. to be in the actual conversation. Marshall. Yeah. Would you rather... Sit through another Christian's crazy question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once a month, uh, you get punched in the face randomly. So 
or the, or eat the, fifty apples. Let him finish the question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, or uh, <laughs> uh, you have to eat fifty apples. No. Wait. What? <laughs> oh. I don't know if I like these. <laughs> <laughs> Found a staple. The one that I ask people that does it does cause quite a bit of controversy is uh, is cheesecake a pie or a cake? I know the answer. You know the answer. Yeah. You've looked it up. I just know the answer. Because you know the definition of a pie and the definition of a cake. I'm gonna say it's a pie, Marshall. Cheesecake is a cake with pie-like qualities. That's why they call it cheesecake no. and not cheese pie. No, it's a pie disguised as a cake with its name. Is a peanut a nut? Yes. No. No? It is not. Oh. Just because it has a, the word nut in it. It's a legume? Something like that. Oh, yeah, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I stand by cheesecake is a cake. Why? Because it has the word cake? Yes, but no. it has the name. So it's a, the whole thing is that there's, this is a, a reversal. This is a, a trick. It is a universal thing. The word cake means something, and yeah. it can be translated to another language. Go ahead. What is the word mean? pie means something, and it can be translated into another language. All right, Mr. And Smart. then cheesecake is a th real thing that could also have words to names for it in other languages. And it might not have the word cake in it in another language. So just because English includes the word cake in it doesn't make it, it the definition... In all other languages. I can't believe how wrong I was. I didn't know that. Thank you, Marshall. Well, you're welcome, Stan. I hope that was of some use. It was of some use. Yeah. Yep. So we're done. We are done. Okay. Thank you, guys and Thank gals you. Um, for joining us for this story time with uh, Papa Marshall. What? <laughs> <laughs> what?